Hello. Oh, hey. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Sean. This is everyone. Say hello to Sean. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I guess we can start. Sure. Um, I, I made sure everyone knows who you are already. So, um, okay. Uh, any first question? Oh, so, uh, we'll come to this. Okay. Uh, I have a basic question. Uh, why did you choose to work on Webpack and not another um, open source project? It's mm. a good question. I guess it kind of comes with a little bit of a story. So um, let's say, so currently I work for an insurance company called Mutual of Omaha. And uh, before that job, I worked at a, I did like a contracting position uh, for two months at a place called Info Group. And, um, being somebody before working at these two places, I had always been very strong in using AngularJS and um, JavaScript and a little bit of server-side programming. But then um, for the first time, I, I worked at a React shop, I guess you could say. And so uh, the build setup that existed at the time was using Webpack. And it was something that I had never seen before. Um, and on top of that, it was just an incredibly awesome experience to develop on. Um, you know, to write React, I didn't have to worry about, or I guess the easiest way to say it is that there are so many nice features that came along with development while I was, you know, trying to learn React at the same time. And it was already configured for me, and so I just overall had a really impact, uh, a huge impact on, on how enjoyable it was to program on a build system using Webpack. Uh, and so, you know, from there, I moved to Mutual of Omaha Insurance Company to be a UX developer. And one of the things was that I had about, because it's an insurance company and we have lots of regulations and guidelines and um, clients and legal for a lot of the web development that we do, uh, I had some basically downtime right when I started working there. And so I took that opportunity to try and take what I had learned from Attention, Webpack please, and then use it safety, at the same time with AngularJS. And so that was that was something new for the first time. Solicitation. Sorry, the air, uh, I'm in the airport terminal. <laughs> That's what the message is for. So long story short, um, I had uh, I, I had just found out, you know, I didn't know that this is how conferences work, but um, you know, after finding out that my company would send me to a conference, I then found out you could submit a talk for a conference. And I was like, okay, why don't we just do this? So I created a, this Angular, JS, and Webpack setup um, that we used in-house and uh, worked really well for us. And I said, why don't I submit a talk on this? And so I submitted a talk to ng-conf and they said, well, uh, we would love for you to come and speak and hold a workshop on how to use Webpack and Angular 2. And so I had never learned Angular 2 before, um, and I really didn't know Webpack that well. And so it gave me the opportunity not only to completely immerse myself in you know, all the different features and possibilities that Webpack can provide, but at the same time, um, it allowed me to, uh, once I spoke there, it, it gave me a lot of insight that nobody really knew what Webpack was in that community. And so it drove me to want to be able to find ways that we could help support the community um, you know, in any way possible. Uh, and so it kind of started from there. And then you know, after, uh, essentially what had happened is that they, there wasn't a core team or uh, the only way that you know, anybody had been able to reach out to them is either through GitHub or like Gitter chat, which is for you know, GitHub repos. And uh, so I just created a private Gator chat, and I threw all the core team members that I knew of that were in there, and I said, hey, I want to I wanna help you guys. I want to get you paid, because I really believe in your tool, and I want to find a way that we can better support this, this tool so it's around in, you know, a year or two years. And so I guess from there, you know, things kind of moved, uh, you know, slowly, and we discussed a lot of different possibilities for the future. And... Um, 
on a podcast with uh, Kent Dodds called JavaScript Air. Uh, I ended up, you know, kind of on the marquee. Uh, somebody had been able to get me on the podcast with them, and <clears throat> essentially, when the marquee showed up, it said introducing the Webpack core team, and I was there with them, uh, you know, with all their photos, and so it was like. Uh, <laughs> So I guess the day of the podcast, they actually asked, you know, would you like to become part of the core team? And I said, well, yes, are you kidding me? So I guess the rest is kind of history from there, but I've been actively working on it ever since. And this was back in June. Okay, thank you. That's very inspiring story, I guess. Uh, so you mentioned that you were working with Angular 1, and now you're working with as I know, on the Angular uh, CLI, <laughs> which is using Webpack uh, mm -hmm. underneath. So could you probably um, explain uh, uh, us the problems that uh, uh, there were when you are when you were working with the Angular CLI? Why using this instead of just, uh, for example, providing templates that are using uh, Webpack? Because from what I know, there is a bit confusion about how to uh, mm -hmm. customize the config of sure, Webpack sure. when you are bootstrapping the application using the CLI. So that's my question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a good question. And so I think it really falls down to ideals um, with how you know the leaders of the project feel the experience should be when somebody uses Angular 2. Um, you can kind of uh, make comparisons to some extent to like create React app. Um, uh, but without an eject button. So the whole goal was to focus on being able to make rapidly, you know, to be able to create an application quick without having to spend time on the build tools. Some of us don't enjoy it as much as others. Uh, so uh, yeah, they wanted to remove that layer from the from the development process. So, um, the ideals right now with the Angular CLI is that they should be able to provide a purely opinionated build process without ever you having to worry about it. Uh, and so like their minimum viable product is essentially being able to use the Angular CLI without configuring Webpack. Um, and so you know, right now, all of that is completely abstracted away. Um, in the future, they, they do still want to be able to provide an outlet, but they want to do it the right way. And so um, the, you know, the primary concerns are being able to make sure that the experience is good end-to-end -end first before letting somebody go out and, and customize and configure. It also kind of allows people to be able, you know, it allows us as the CLI team to be able to focus on bugs that are really pertaining to the configurations that we've built and not, let's say, user error or something else like that. So it, it it's a good development cycle for right now, but I, I, I do know that they definitely want to be able to add Webpack as a configurable, um, essentially, or configure the compiler you know, in some sort of add-on system. Actually, one question that uh, I've related to that is um, currently, for example, when uh, there are, there's some feature that in order to use it, to add it to the build tool chain, uh, if if just simply using Webpack and uh, like manually uh, setting up, for example, an Angular 2 application, like if we want to use Jade or Pug templates, for example, uh, sure. the process is quite simple. But with the CLI, we've actually had a case in our team when we wanted to use that, and that, that was a very very big pain point. Yeah, do you? Uh, have you I, I guess you probably encountered some some uh, a lot of issues similar similar to that. Do you have any kind of solutions for 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 people who have such problems right now? Yeah, we've definitely come across it. You know, um, not that it's a bad thing, but. It, you know, the beautiful part about Webpack and why uh, there's so many options and why maybe some people think it's hard to configure is that, you know, it's designed to work around your stack or your style or your coding standards, et cetera, and not vice versa. And so, um, you know, it, is, it does come with issues when you try to fundamentally lock down the configuration. You, uh, you know, you end up having to filter down that subset of Snowflake projects that maybe can't work with it just yet until it's configurable. Um, but I would say that, you know, to work around, I do it myself because, you know, I'll take a project, but then I'll hack on the source code while, uh, you know, to try and fix a bug or something reproducible. Uh, you can go into the no module package and um, 
you know, the configurations are using the Node API. So essentially, you know, you can you, you can add, let's say, you can customize any of the partial configurations that we have set up there inside of. Uh, I think it's called like the build folder. Um, but it does require you going into no modules, and then you kind of have to lock down the state of those dependencies, et cetera. Um, but you know, there is a way to do it. It's just not really a, a very dev-friendly way to do it. OK, uh, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so questions? OK. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is very general. Uh, what were the biggest changes in the second version of Webpack? Um, I'm glad you asked, because I literally spent two hours of my flight this morning uh, working on a recap doc so that we could publish for our, our publication. So um, I think the top, let's say, five um, that come to mind are the first is that Webpack now, by default, can read and parse native ES6 import and export statements. Um, and so alone as a feature, it maybe is not that big of a deal, but you don't necessarily have to depend on Babel if you want to write ES6 modules. Um, on top of that, though, that leads to like a second feature, which is it allows Webpack to perform a process called tree shaking. So tree shaking is just because ES6 imports and exports are statically analyzable, um, you know, you can find out exactly what exports are not used and which ones are used in your code to remove, essentially, unused code. Um, and so Webpack can mark those dependencies that aren't actually being used in your dependency graph, and then uh, something like Uglify.js or uh, Closure Compiler plugin will just remove those in a process they call dead code elimination. Uh, I guess if I had some other features, one that I really enjoy uh, is the performance budgets. Um, so it's not, uh, the feature itself is not fully enabled, but it is partially. So let's say if you're, you know, you use Webpack 2 for the first time and um, you have a, let's say you have some sort of bundle that's created from using it that exceeds a certain file limit, like 250 KB. Um, you're actually going to get some sort of feedback that's like that line item in your build uh, feedback will be highlighted and it'll have a little big marker next to it. So, um, you know, myself and the Chrome team um, have been working together to be able to set some some awareness, I guess, uh, awareness benchmarks so that people understand that when you ship over a certain amount of code that it can be really detrimental to page speeds, especially for like mobile devices. Um, and since people are, what, 76% of users, you know, uh, now what is it? Uh, I think right now the current state of the web is that 76% of uh, websites or mobile-ready websites take longer than, on average, 14 seconds to load. And so um, it was kind of a combination of due diligence uh, to help promote a better, faster web. Um, but then at the same time, also kind of bringing awareness to the developer to, uh, you know, to identify and easily measure and address certain issues where they might have a larger bundle, but it, you know, the things that you've been doing may not, you know, shouldn't be that way, uh, or you're not expecting it to be that large. So uh, performance budgets is what we call it, and you can use it with a performance property. Um, and then I guess two other really big features would probably be um, uh, behind the scenes, we completely redid the Webpack Resolver. And so uh, we have a package in our GitHub organization called Enhanced Resolve. And essentially what that represents, it, it is a, um, a layer that sits on top of Node.js's module resolution system. So when you use like require and then you know a path to a module, uh, Node.js has a specific native algorithm that will look for different package fields and kind of fall back in a waterfall fashion. Uh, enhanced Resolve is at the top of that and has a few more extra conditions and flexibility so that it can be pluggable and customizable. So we completely redid Enhanced Resolve for Webpack 2. And um, if you've been using the beta, that's nothing, nothing too big of a deal. I'm going to let the message go for a second. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and then the last feature, I think, uh, 
which is probably pretty notable, is that we've changed the way. Um, so module.loaders is now called rules. Um, really, it's more than just a property change, though. We have this concept of what's rule set. And so when you pass loaders in, there's a much more flexible and dynamic, uh, consistent approach to having, uh, you know, defining your loaders and what files they, they uh, are applied against. Um, and you have all, uh, a bunch of smaller features that make it much more flexible to do some pretty interesting things. Um, and then I think last but not least, and probably was the biggest priority, was our, our documentation. So, you know, our new docs, you know, we can because, you know, it really represents us putting the community first in terms of what was really the biggest need for you guys and being able to, you know, to use this tool and make it your own. And so documentation was that number one request. And so you can go to webpack.js.org and see, you know, our, our new documentation page, which is all from uh, Webpack 2 and on. <clears throat> and, and you can see all of these different changes. Uh, you know, it's full of guides and um, a much more usable layout that's mobile friendly. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot of great feedback as well as a, a huge amount of public contributors who just want to be able to give back and help make the docs better also. So I'd say those are probably like the five or six top, top features. Do we have other questions? Okay, one moment. Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, Hi, Chris. Nice to have you here. <laughs> I got this uh, like a philosophy, but um, what's the uh, what's the border for you between uh, supporting and contributing in project and uh, creating new one, new way, instead of uh, just the revolution instead of the evolution? <laughs> so, um, when you say creating a new project, you mean like uh, like redoing a new open source project, or more like I mean, like uh, I, I'm supporting, I'm tri contributing in, uh, for example, uh, uh, Task Runner, and I don't like the way it is going. So uh, I'm creating new one, or I'm just um, just just by revolution, I'm just creating new one, or just uh, I want to uh, this project to ev evaluate to to my way, my vision. <laughs> You know, so that's <laughs> that's a really good question um, because, you know, you wouldn't be the first person, you know, who has had issues with Webpack or how some things work. Uh, a lot of folks think, tend to think that, you know, the library itself is maybe more of a Swiss Army knife that can do anything but maybe not perfect, you know, may not be the best tool for the one job. Um, you know, I don't share that same opinion. Um, but what we've really tried to champion is being able to pull those people in to help you know, shape and and help our tool evolve because, you know, one of the things that's been the most important to me and us and the entire team and, and the community is that we're putting the community's needs first. And so, you know, I, li I like to say that if, you know, if you take the people who I guess are the biggest antagonists to your product and you you can leverage them to, to help really challenge the status quo of how, you know, a tool is designed. Um, you know, it may not be the case where you meet eye to eye on everything, but you should aim to be as perceptive as possible. Now, I guess if it's in a situation like where you are where, you know, um, you know, fundamentally you can't see eye to eye with, you know, a maintainer, um, you know, hopefully it would be more it really depends on the project, but you know, in my eyes, you know, you would want to have for any sustainable open source project, have a, a team of people who can help kind of bring a variety of perspectives, so that you know, it's not just one person knocking it down and saying no, that's not possible, or you know, we don't want to go this direction. So um, you know, two ways to go about it, and this is kind of what I've suggested to people is one, you could help contribute to some sort of you know, plug-in or, or uh, what do they call it, add-on system to the existing repo that can, uh, you know, allow you to build your custom overriding functionality in. 
And so the benefits of that is that you still are one project, you're still one community, but now you've added a new augmentation on top of that that could potentially benefit anybody who is in the same shoes you are. I guess then the other, the, the other approach, or I, I think of it as plan B, um, would be, you know, if you really want to just make it your own and only your own and don't really care about the community itself, then, you know, by all means, go ahead and do so. But if you want to also get other people on board, I would challenge you, you know, as a maintainer myself, I would challenge you and say, you should try and and have a, as much feature parity as possible with the existing tool that you wanted to change. Um, and it kind of, you know, one, it kind of opens your eyes to being able to kind of think about your tool and the impact it has on its users, but then at the same time, uh, you know, could can really propel your fork or branch to, uh, you know, to be better than, than its originator. Um, Hopefully I answered that question. Okay. Uh, so um, I guess Webpack is uh, doing pretty good in terms of um, contributors. And also it is uh, right now on Open Collective, also doing pretty good, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, have you explored any other um, opportunities <coughs> to collect the um, money, actually, for... Um, yeah, well... The uh, uh, link of Webpack? Yeah, explored might be a strong word, but uh, considered our options, maybe not yet implemented them or tried to take action on them. Uh, yeah, definitely. So, I mean, there's a bunch of different avenues that you have to take to at least be monetarily sustainable. Um, I guess the question is, you know, what are you trying to accomplish in terms of the funding? So, are you wanting to funnel that money back into the community who also contributes? Or is it just used to help pay for the maintainers to work on it full time? Um, one of the, I would say one of the other ways that we've kind of, you know, tried to tackle uh, ways of getting money is through um, providing support services. And you know, Open Collective is just kind of like our our bank account, but then also a way for people to submit expenses. Um, so, you know, on top of that, you know, we can take all sorts of avenues to collect that money and have it funnel back into that account. So, like, one of the other ways that has been really exciting to me is maybe the possibility in the future is to do, like, a complete video series, um, you know, and, and have it be a paid subscription that users, you know, can, uh, you know, can pay to use and learn, but then at the same time, they're giving back to our open collective and supporting our project and our efforts. And so you're either essentially helping support us make more videos, new features, uh, try and uh, you know help support other contributors apart from just us. Um, but then there's also like uh, let's say like consulting services and support services uh, that we we've definitely explored and are always entertaining as an option to you know to help people better adopt the tool. Um, great answer, I guess. Do we have other questions? Okay. Hi. Okay, so hey. back to the technical stuff, maybe. Uh, uh, is there any uh, online course or uh, documentation about the internal workings of Webpack? Just how it works internally, <laughs> especially 2.0? Yes, uh, you know what? Uh, official? No, absolutely not. But. Um, you know, that's one of the things that I've been really uh, passionate about lately, you know, myself as a maintainer is that, um, you know, I've been trying to recruit and evangelize to explore our ecosystem um, because when somebody contributes to Webpack, it could be the docs, it could be Webpack core, it could be like the, the nine external NPM modules that we also use for Webpack uh, that we've written ourselves. Um, or it could be, you know, just performance optimizations. Uh, so there's a lot of material to work with to contribute. In terms of your answer, um, there are a couple videos that I have done personally. Um, one called Read the Source. I think you could search it on YouTube. There's a channel. Um, and you can kind of, you know, it was the first time I ever did a, a live stream walkthrough for the code. 
but I've heard that it, it was pretty helpful for people. Um, I think the second one would probably be. Um, uh, that would be a good one. I also kind of do some Twitch and YouTube live streams, so you could check out my YouTube channel, and sometimes I'll I'll do some code walkthroughs for people who like, you know, they'll say, "Hey, I want to contribute," and I'm like, "All right." But only if you join a live stream, and then we're going to learn about it and ask questions together, so that people can, you know, have the same answers or the same questions answered that they might ask me uh, myself. So I guess in short, without rambling, you can check my YouTube channel. You can check the Read the Source YouTube channel as well as um, you follow me on Twitter because I've been doing this like handwritten annotation of walking through a single like one workflow through all of Webpack. So uh, you can see me kind of periodically, uh, you know, noting in the files themselves some on my, uh, my, surface, uh, my surface book, and it kind of shows exactly what's going on with little notes and, and information. I did like seven, I did seven pages today on the plane, so I should be publishing some more of those probably after this podcast. If another question already? Yeah. Uh, hi, the world of uh, front-end uh, build tools is like full of different different approaches of how can you do stuff, and uh, we can say that Webpack is what one of the most popular at this moment. But uh, which of the uh, competing tools you would say will be the most challenging to the Webpack tool in the near future, and why? Hmm. <laughs> I think the you know, it's so funny that you mentioned that because um, the other tools that are out there, uh, I don't want to say that they're different, but they really are. They are either tackling a subset of challenges that Webpack t tackles, um, so they might be more focused. Like Rollup, for example, is a great one. Uh, Rollup is is just focused on tree shaking for ES6 modules. Uh, but it doesn't really have support for lazy loading. It doesn't. Uh, it's not the easiest to configure to try and transform other types of files like Webpack does. Um, and so, you know, another side would be, let's say, like Browserify. Browserify is kind of where Webpack was inspired from, along with a couple other different tools. Um, it came before Webpack, but um, you know, it continues to have development, and so uh, if there's any tool that could try and reach feature parity, I guess, Browserify might be it. Um, but when you look at our source code, you kind of get an understanding that the system design was was put in place to scale and to be able to handle a complex variety of scenarios, which is like, you know, that's what web is today. Everybody wants to use a different stack, like, you know, every other day. And so, uh, you know, if a tool was to be, you know, popular competitor, it might be one that, um, you know, that, that challenges a few specific uh, features. Like Rollup, I think, is probably the closest. That's because the overall code size is is really superior uh, to to what Webpack outputs. Rollup is probably better for libraries. If you are publishing libraries, then you would probably use Rollup, but in projects that Web. Uh, when in terms of like s different stacks, uh, if I'm right, Laravel is already like uh, shipping with support of uh, Webpack, or was it Browserify? Yep. Yeah, sure, uh, but... it's shipping yeah. with Webpack now as the default. Yeah, yeah. and uh, also I guess uh, DHH is working on um, implementing web using Webpack for uh, Rails. Yes, uh, I think you were like uh, talking talking with them, so. Do you know what's the progress uh, on it is already, or? Uh, I think it may be finished. I know oh. that it was like 5.1, 5.2, in which it shipped as a, a feature to be able to add. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I'd have to double check in, on the repo to see what the progress is. But I think their, their Ruby gem is actually called Webpacker. And so that's all finalized, and it just provides a really base, super vanilla, um, with like nothing in it but Babel support inside the configuration taking more of an opinionated approach rather than opinionated. Um, do we have other questions? One moment.
Hi, I'm Tom. Uh, can you tell how does your daily routine look like, like at work? <laughs> oh man, well, <laughs> well, I have my real job, um, which is you know, so probably uh, the hours are pretty flexible. So anywhere between, let's say, uh, you know, seven thirty to to nine thirty, um, I'll come in, and then uh, really, I have about an hour commute, and. Uh, I'm early, you know. I'll get up a little early, uh, and so I'll probably catch up on all the. First thing when I get up, I catch up on all the China, London, and like all the tweets and everything that's gone on overnight, and just search Webpack and see what people have said, and then I'll re respond to anybody who needs help, um, or maybe retweet something that's great. And then once I'm done with there, I'll, uh, you know, I'll probably go my commute and I get to work. I'll probably review the Webpack Slack really quick, and then. See if there's any issues or anything that's that's critical, um, and then you know I just uh, I work primarily right now a project that is implementing a really complex build architecture using Webpack, and so uh, I get really the chance to just work on work itself, and then I think during lunch, uh, you know I typically will spend time just on the GitHub repo, responding to tweets, helping people who need it. Um, you know, guiding contributors if they need support, and then you know when I get home, I have kind of like this holy period where you know I from like six to nine, you know I am just with my wife and my ten month old, and so I, that that time is is kind of reserved just for them and myself, and and then afterwards I'll probably stay up till like. <laughs> Midnight to two in the morning, just doing open source Webpack and you know trying to catch up with features and changes. So it's pretty it's pretty hectic and it's not consistent, but you know that might be a good average. You know you could describe that as probably the norm for me. So how would you me measure by the end of the day that you've done good work that day? Done good work on what? Uh, like for my job or for uh, for Webpack? Probably for Webpack or just for you, yourself, like considering family and everything? So, you know, um, I think, you know, in terms of, I guess, satisfaction or, or the reassurance that what I'm doing is, is right comes from a couple different things. Um, you know, I think. If I'm going through Twitter and I just see one tweet about somebody saying, "Man, Webpack has made my life easier. Thank you guys so much," or praising our docs page, or um, let's say like being excited about being able to merge their first PR into a repo in the Webpack organization. To me, that's a win, um, and that's a win for the day for Webpack because really this tool is meant for for the users. Um, we we're not backed by a company. Uh, well, I mean, we're not backed by one company like Google and Angular, Facebook and React. Um, you know, we're literally the tool that has you know, been shaped by the community itself. And so, uh, for me, that's you know, being able to at least just see one person satisfied, and you know, uh, you know, being able to just get my work at, you know, my work at my real job done. You know, those would probably be the two wins. Uh, other questions. Uh, one more technical question, uh, a bit related to the previous ones uh, about the competing software, though uh, competing libraries. Though I would say, <laughs> in this case, um, complementing, uh, because first when Webpack, uh, when Webpack came, uh, everyone was using well, Grunt, Gulp, Browserify, a combination uh, of those, and then kind of people, some people started using Webpack for everything, and there were opinions that well, you should just use just ditch uh, Grunt, Gulp, whatever, and just use a combination of Webpack and just simply npm tasks for task running. Mm -hmm. And now there are, I, I guess, more moderate op mo opinions that well, maybe you should use a combination of the two. So where do you think it's like you should draw the line between like Webpack and like for example Grunt or Gulp, and should they do you think they should be used together, or is is like 
uh, grunt or gulp uh, or other task runners pretty much unnecessary once you just use Webpack and um, NPM tasks? Um, so like it's a tough question because it's going to be completely subjective, uh, you know, and I'm biased. Uh, but you know the the right answer to tell you would be use what works for you. Uh, you know, use what works for your stack and use use what's comfortable. But um, you know, from a technical standpoint, um, you know, like you you said, they are just task runners. Um, and so, you know, if you just need to run a task, you can do through you can do so through npm and npm scripts. Um, like my personal opinion, like if it was my choice in a project, um, I try to keep the dependencies as small as possible. And you know, Webpack has a lot of dev dependencies already. So, um, you know, pulling in a, something else like Grunt or Gulp uh, usually just is overkill to let's say perform like a you know some sort of task. Um, but it also depends on you know how encompassing is you know. How many different assets are you letting Webpack control? Um, to me, and this is probably definitely a biased opinion, is that you know as long as it's a asset that's going to be used in your web page, Webpack should at least you know it should at least go through Webpack, uh, you know through its loaders. It doesn't necessarily have to be bundled into JavaScript, but uh, you you gain all these extra benefits like. You know, you can compress images, or you can, if you wanted to inline images, you can, let's say, um, you never have to worry about setting URLs or paths once it's configured properly. Um, so I mean, it, the, the, the bad but right answer is it depends, and you should choose what works for you. But I guess if it was my choice, you know, I'd say you could go Webpack only and use NPM scripts. I have one comment to that because uh, I, I've been using um, Ionic 2 for, for quite a while uh, right now and I've seen how they actually changed so many times their, their build process and first they uh, used, as far as I know, Webpack 1, then uh -huh. they changed to a combination of Gulp and Browserify, then they decided maybe they'll try Webpack 2, then they changed to Rollup. And now they're finally back with Webpack 2 and just simple NPM scripts and, and kind of their homemade uh, little module for, for, for some other scripts. And and looks like they're, they're kind of doing it uh, quite well right now. So so I, I'd say I pretty much have the same opinion uh, yeah. as you looking at how this works. Yeah, I mean, it's like how much extra knowledge debt do you want to pull in? And so like to me, I'd rather have to only worry about fully immersing myself in Webpack and uh, you know NPM scripts rather than another build task on top of it in documentation. Okay, so uh, any more questions? Okay. So because Webpack alone can be sometimes quite slow on bigger projects, there are some tools like DLL plugin or uh, what's his name, the Happy Pack. Uh, yep, that's correct. So yeah, why isn't it this, especially Happy Pack, because it's like a multi-threaded environment, why isn't it shipped by default? Is, is, it, is there any specific reason for that? Um, so Happy Pack was something that was created as a, you know, just like a another project from somebody else. Um, it's a tough thing to answer in terms of why. Well, I can tell you why. Is that uh, it doesn't work for everything. So like Happy Pack is something you attach to your loaders, and it creates worker threads. You know, it spawns worker threads so that loaders can execute concurrently and in parallel. But the problem is, is that for loaders that what I call hacky loaders, which uh, uh, access the plugin instances, like the compiler, the compilation, or the module, cannot successfully work with Happy Pack. And the reason, uh, basically, essentially, it's because of race conditions with when a plugin executes versus when these concurrent threads are, are running. So a good example is. Uh, any of the TypeScript loaders out there have that hacky access to the compiler or the compilation. And so because of that, 
you can't use Happy Pack with TypeScript Loader or Awesome TypeScript Loader. Uh, and so, and, and that's just one of the loaders that, uh, you know, that does this. There are more than a few that do it out there. And so our philosophy, again, is if we're going to pull in a feature, we need to make sure that it works across the board. And so, you know, to be honest, we've actually discussed this uh, as a core team, you know, at length because we want to be able to leverage this kind of share, uh, this kind of threaded worker environment so that, you know, you can do multi-threading in a node node environment. Um, but the first thing that we would need to do first is kind of we have to apply breaking changes to our loader API so that, uh, you know, things like TypeScript loader and extract uh, the extract text plugin loader and uh, some other loaders uh, don't have to actually access the compiler and et cetera. So uh, it, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you have to keep a really broad scope of what everybody is doing when you're worrying about a project like this and adding new features because it has to work for anybody. And so, <laughs> um, you know, it takes time to slowly make changes, like breaking changes to make something like this possible. But that's a good question. I mean, uh, that that is other things that you can do or you can look into in terms of, uh, what would I say, other things that you can invest your time into and in speeding up builds are things like uh, Babel. If you're using Babel, you can use the uh, use cache property or cache directories property. And that, that can result in a lot of uh, speed improvements as well as a, a plugin that somebody from our contributor team made called Hard Source Webpack Plugin. Uh, and it takes caching to like the nth level to even to disk caching for like build results. And so it can be way faster uh, for incremental builds. Super useful. Um, do we have other questions? Okay, I, well, maybe uh, one for me. I have uh, one question that's um, kind of, uh, I, I see people uh, who come from a big background like Gulp and Grunt, and they don't really want to use Webpack because the first thing they think when you mention Webpack is, oh my god, that's so complicated. Everyone's saying how, how hard it is to actually get started. Do you have any like uh, resources that, that you, you think are good for, for um, uh, people who hesitate to start to use web, Webpack? Like some, you know, something written in a quite easy and accessible way because maybe not the docs may not always be the best way to start to actually convince someone that it's it's rather it's actually easy to 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 get and start using the closest thing that we have right now would be kind of our why webpack section in our docs page but you know i think there isn't maybe like some talks that i've done in the past um you know you can always i think where would it be a place you could find that? Um, you can go on YouTube, and I think you can search uh, Webpack the Core Concepts, and you'll find a, a couple talks by me um, that kind of did, I'll touch on it a little bit and kind of a compelling argument for why you want to want to do this um, or change from Gulp to Webpack. Uh, I think the number one hurdle for people who are going from let's say Grunt to Webpack is that with Grunt or Gulp you don't have to really write modules. You can just write scripts that are in different files with ifies, and Grunt and Gulp, all they're doing is smashing it together. So you're just concatenating all that file, and uh, you know whatever overhead and things you might not be using, those will still probably end up in your project. And the same thing applies with uh, you know libraries like Lodash. You may only use two functions, but if you're using Grunt and Gulp, uh, I guess, you can use the individual NPM libraries, but let's say if you wanted to include the whole thing and tree shake it out and only use the dependencies you actually request, you, know, you can't do that through Grunt and Gulp because they don't use a dependency graph. And so um, I think it, it's a change. It, uh, people worry about it because it, it changes how your code looks and works because you're now transforming you know, your code base into like a module system that actually uses CommonJS or AMD uh, versus just like some, you know, five lines of jQuery wrapped in a, you know, a function expression. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's a paradigm shift and it's a lot of new things to understand. And so um, maybe, maybe I'll have to just have a video that touches on that. And
I guess. Uh, so you mentioned that it made the bundle smaller. So uh, that should be pretty great for uh, progressive web apps. Uh, and I see a lot of traction for in this topic uh, recently. So my question is, uh, will you be working more on with the um, frameworks uh, developers uh, on actually improving the um, possibilities of uh, creating progressive web apps? Because well, Webpack fits pretty well there, but uh, what can we do more to actually uh, make the web better? Um, so it, it's it, it depends for each library and framework. Um, so like there are the code that let's say transpiles from Babel to ES5, or the code that transpiles from TypeScript to ES5 um, is not always tree shakeable. And so, uh, you know, we're trying to work on certain features like being able to work with Minify, uh, like Uglify JS to better tree shake for, uh, you know, the code that we output. Um, and so that's one of our primary concerns for, let's say, frameworks like Angular or um, anybody using ES6 that's transpiling it down um, and using classes. But overall, um, I think things that we can better do is help frameworks promote the use of you know, lazy loading, code splitting, uh, whether it be in their routers or just in their module system in general. Uh, one of the things I really, probably one of my favorite parts about Vue.js is that anywhere throughout the entire library and its supporting libraries, its router, you know, its component, its server side stuff, um, the component property always takes one of two things, a component or a function or a promise that returns a component. And so by doing that, it allows developers to use design or you know patterns for code splitting that you know Webpack takes advantage of, like import or system.import or require ensure. And so it's a really seamless integration to be able to code split with any framework that you want. Um, I think the more and more that frameworks start to respect those build standards that you know Webpack has set. Um, you know, the more successful they're going to be at being able to provide a platform to create progressive web apps. I'm pretty happy to hear uh, if you just mentioned here, um, <laughs> yeah, obviously. Uh, so uh, another question, um, will there be some, I don't know, a guide to how to write code that is actually pretty good, uh, like it is able to be tree shaken, shaken off, I guess. Um, yeah, the easiest way to describe it is don't use ES6 classes if you want to tree shake them. <laughs> uh, instead, use just export functions from a file, and that's it. If you do that, Uglify.js has no problem with it. But if you're exporting a class with methods inside of it, um, you will not be able to tree shake that code. And it's because of the way that Babel kind of takes a ES6 class and converts it into like the function constructor, but it's also wrapped around a second iffy that's assigned to a variable. And so Uglify is not, doesn't perform uh, program flow analysis to understand that that really is a pure function or there really aren't side effects. It literally looks at face value and sees it's a side effect and it can't shake it. So to me, I you know, like it's not, if you wanted to really have tree shaking to the fullest, write functions, export, and you know, import functions, and that's it. Uh, if you do that, then you're on your way to, I guess, pure functions also. Because uh, you know, side effects always make it harder to tree shake. But um, you know, if you write pure functions and share them across files, then it can be easily tree shaken. Really, really helpful. Uh, do you have other questions? Anyone? Okay, Shimon. Uh, I have one question, but I, I guess it's I guess it's quite specific. I'm not okay. sure if you've had any uh, experience okay. with it. Is uh, I'm personally using uh, Node WebKit or NWJS, uh, which right now is uh, basically Electron is taking over as the go-to like 
uh, framework or tool for for doing uh, desktop apps with with JS. But I'm kind of sticking with uh, NWJS because it's got compatibility with like X Windows XP and other old systems. Mm -hmm. And um, there's one thing. Well, I I'm trying to use um, Webpack with it, but the thing that it does uh, underneath it's it's pretty um, <laughs> magical in that uh, when you use uh, require uh, like the the common JS style uh, require uh, for node modules, it actually goes and switches context from the from the browser from Chromium to Node, and you can just use require for both node modules, and you can uh, you can require front uh, well the, the front end part, and it actually knows what to do. And when combined with Webpack, yes. then it totally crashes on the requires that uh, are supposed to load the node modules. Have you ever encountered something like this? Maybe any other external libraries that mess with uh, require and how Webpack handles it because it just crashes like completely uh, when it encounters something like that. Are you using the node WebKit target in Webpack? Uh, actually. That's that's quite useful. I I don't think that's uh, I I've seen that documented. Uh, that's that's a, that's a useful uh, tip. There is a target uh, that you can access. If you go to our our new docs, you can see it under I think concepts targets. Um, so we have like six targets that we support. It's Atom, elect so basically electron based. So electron main and an electron renderer, which is like front and server side. Uh, Node WebKit, Web Worker target. So you can use Webpack to bundle a web worker. Uh, and then also uh, node, web, and then async node. So if you wanted to create an async module, you can do so with Webpack as well. So I would take a look at the node web kit target and try it out and see what happens. Um, but if you have any suggestions or feedback, and maybe uh, it was a feature that was implemented a while ago. And so you know we don't have a lot of tests around it. We don't have a lot. So I'm still comfortable supporting it as long as, you know, somebody there understands how it's supposed to work, and you know we can make it work for you. I'm actually using for for side project, and I've just recently uh, thought of maybe in, including Webpack in it. So I've I've tried uh, a bit, and it didn't work. So I didn't look uh, much into that. But it's actually great to know that that there's a supported config for for Node WebKit. So so, so that's uh, great news, and I, I think that's actually a thing that probably not not many uh, people know uh, who may still using be, uh, be using Node WebKit. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for that. No problem. Um, room for other one question, I guess. What do you think about the future of JavaScript? Do you think there will be some kind of merge between uh, Chrome and Node? Like, you could run the same code on Chrome in V8 and on Node? What do you think about that? Oh, man. I would love that. <laughs> and then we would need it. <laughs> we wouldn't need a node and a and a, a web target and web pack, and we wouldn't need like a you know three waterfall process for resolving you know the package.json main fields. Um, do I think it'll get that far? No, I don't think they will ever merge. Um, and this is you know uneducated opinion, I suppose, but um, I think that you know, Node is designed to be as fast as possible, and so, like, all those extra DOM APIs and everything like that, I don't think is something that they're ever interested in wanting to add. Um, and I think you could probably make the same argument on the other side, where, you know, if you're running client-side code, you know, you can't use modules like file system and some other things that are very Node-specific patterns. Uh, but I do think that there are some things that are standardizing, like let's say the global and the window object. I think that's in like stage two proposal right now for the ECMAScript standard. Um, but there are some things that I do really think will unite Node and, and the browsers. And that's probably what I think the future of JavaScript will be, is, is typed JavaScript compiling down to WebAssembly. Um, I think that's where JavaScript will go. Um, I hope that's where it goes because of a whole bunch of different benefits to both of those things. Um, but really, you know, like, like three months is like 40 JavaScript years, so there's no way to tell what's going to happen. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. Uh, do we have other questions? If not, we are like the end, I guess. Hmm? Okay. okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, Thank you. Let's wave, probably. Applause. Thank you guys very much. Okay. We are not holding you anymore. Uh, enjoy your trip to San Francisco, I guess. All right. And thank, thank you for doing this. See you. It's my pleasure.